Coming up on Theater Talk... Louis Armstrong was a major key artist. He was fundamentally an optimist. Now, he wasn't naive right. in any way. He knew the score about the world. Right. But he, he looked on the bright side. And also he got yeah. stoned every night of his every life. Every day of his life. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Louis Armstrong was one of the greatest musical artists of the 20th century, and he was the first jazz superstar. He happened to be, by the way, my, fa my father's favorite, uh, favorite musician. Well, then time. there you I go. I grew up with eight-track tapes. was Bob Riedel's. Eight-track <laughs> tapes <laughs> in the big Chrysler uh, 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 wagon listening to Louis Armstrong. Eight track tapes. Remember eight, tra Terry, that remember eight track tapes? That dates us, Well, That's a chunk. Well, <laughs> chunk. That's right, you could, I, you could, all you could do is fast forward. That's all you could do That's to all you could, yeah. song, but yeah. Not to take anything away from your father's eight track collection, <laughs> yes. but Terry Teachout, yes. the eminent critic for the Wall Street Journal and Commentary Magazine, has written a play about Louis Armstrong, Satchmo at the Waldorf, which is now playing at the West Side And it's based, on it's based on Terry's his. excellent new book, no, it's an Pops. excellent 2009 book. 2009 book. Pops. It's an it excellent old book. Yeah. Is it in paperback, though, Pops? Yes. Still is. and available on Kindle, but we get ahead of ourselves. There is an amazing performance by John Douglas Thompson, who is returning to us. Yes, after... For a uh, second time this season. After a time to kill. After a time, after a time, to, time kill, to, to kill. I remember we had a very jolly interview. Yep. You were great in a time to kill, but this is you alone on stage, and it is... Something you and a trumpet, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and, a and several and a characters. Right. Yes, and Miles Davis. <laughs> we'll talk, you play. Terry, the, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a quick question, though. Um, why did he have two nicknames? Why Satchmo and why Pops? Well, they were unrelated. He was called, Satchmo is short for Satchel Mouth. He was dubbed that when he went to England. Uh, and Armstrong had a very large mouth. And he, he, he got shortened by accent to Satchmo. Accent by the British Satchmo. accent, yeah. Yeah, and he loved Satchel it. Mouth. He, he loved it. You know, he put it on his stationery. He embraced the name. Mm. Pops was what he called people. He called everybody Pops, especially if you can remember your name. And uh -huh. so people started calling him that back. <laughs> and it's very natural, of course, because he's a great father figure of jazz, and that's right. how it ended up becoming the title of my book. What got you on to this extensive research and artistic inspiration, which has led to a book and a play about Louis Armstrong. Well, it goes all back, all the way back to childhood. I was, it was 1964, I guess, and I was playing in the backyard one Sunday, and my mother said, I want you to come in, so I came in, and she said, there's somebody on the television I want you to see because he won't be around forever. And it was Armstrong, I think probably performing Hello, Dolly! on The Ed Sullivan Show. And like everybody else who sees him for the first time, I was just blown away. And this was one of the seeds that eventually led to my becoming a jazz musician, which was what I did before I became a writer. Um, if you're interested in jazz, you're interested in Armstrong. And many, many, many years later, I realized there needs to be a new biography of Armstrong. There's an enormous amount of source material. He's somebody I'd like to write about. Biographers are drawn to great personalities, and Louis Armstrong was the greatest of personalities. So I wrote this book. When did yes. you encounter uh, Armstrong? You mean as a just as a, as a person, as a kid? Yeah. When were you? I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think it was. I think I saw him do the some Disney song, Zippity Doo Dah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right. I saw that, and and I have to be very. And I told this with Terry, and also with Gordon. My first encounter with Armstrong was. Uh, was a very negative one. I didn't quite receive him in the same way that most people. As was the case him. with many people. Of and what you well, say negative, negative my generation. You, you thought he. You did. know, there was this whole thing about the Uncle Tom thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. and the the big smile and the grin and the sweating and the handkerchief and the mugging. 
Uh, and to sell was, out to the the white song, kinda, Slow Dolly and all that. Right, stuff. and I didn't really understand that aspect of it. I just looked at him on TV and he didn't seem like a substantial figure, someone that I should be focusing on or paying attention well, to. Well, this is much about the struggle that you're dealing with. Right, that we're dealing with. I just he kind of seemed like an old relic. Yes. Pr promoting more stereotypes than anything and else. And of course that was... He but was that was pain. my very thin view uh, thin perspective of him, so you know, the play kind of gave me a perspective. In Terry Teachout's wonderful book, I found this quote by Ossie Davis, and he said, most of the fellows I grew up with, myself included, we used to laugh at Louis Armstrong. We knew he was good, but that didn't save him from our malice and ridicule. Everywhere we'd look, there'd be Louis, sweat popping, eyes bugging, mouth wide open, grinning from ear to ear, mopping his brow, ducking his head, doing his thing for the white man. Was that your response in the beginning? Well, I was... Certainly, I didn't quite take it to that yeah. extent, but I could understand where he's coming but from. But then he goes on to say that he met Louis Armstrong and yes. developed tremendous developed respect. Um, and that criticism that Ozzie Davis hurled at um, Armstrong at that particular time in his life, was there any validity to that? Had he sold out in any way? Was he... It just depends on your point of view. You have to remember Armstrong was, was not... Ozzie Davis's contemporary. He was born in 1901. The world was different. Mm. When he was coming up, he was a, a titanic figure of racial pride, as well as a great culture-changing genius. Nobody remains contemporary forever. And by the 50s, by the 60s, racial attitudes had changed. But Armstrong was still the man that he had always been. He saw no reason to change. He was what he was. And so he was seen in a different way. Um, the validity is a matter of your point of view. I think once you get, if you have a problem with the surface, once you get below that surface, you discover the great master, the great artist, and also the great spirit. And part of the idea, both of writing Pops and of writing Satchmo at the Waldorf, is to take you below that surface, to take you backstage, to show you what Armstrong was really like when the red light was off. And we're able to do that because Armstrong wrote thousands of letters. He made lots of private tapes of his, his offstage conversations, which John has heard. Yeah. You can know what he was like when the public wasn't looking. So he was, like any great entertainer, he had created a personality that had always worked and he was going to stick to it. Well, I mean, it wasn't entirely a creation. I mean, Armstrong, the Armstrong that you saw on television came up was, yeah, it was the real Louis Armstrong. I think a lot of people tend to look at Armstrong from the perspective of Hello Dolly. Yeah. And the guy on stage with the handkerchief and sweating and singing Hello Dolly. He's so much more than that. And so the play gives a much more broader context. So what I learned was you know, not only his greatness, his ebullience, his obvious commitment to civil rights, the way he felt about art and politics and other things, but I also learned, like, what was his general motor? What, he, what drove him to be as good as he is, or good as he was, I'm sorry, and how he made such an incredible impact on not only Americans, but all over the world. Yeah. And so once you, you look at his whole life in context, you see, the Amer you see the icon, you see the genius. Where I was looking at, my generation typically followed people like Miles Davis and John Coltrane and Wayne Shorter, you know, boppers, right? And, that's, and they were very aggressive musicians, yeah, yeah. And very aggressive about civil rights and all that sort of stuff. And also, they had contempt for him, but they had, Miles Davis made a big point of saying, I studied music, and I went right, well, to Well, that's college. the Dizzy Gillespie thing. Exactly, yeah. and you have, as you make so clear, this Louis Armstrong, who came from nothing, learned to play the cornet and developed it in the orphan, in the, in the, right. in the welfare home, waste. and then worked all his life and was just this natural genius. But also a serious and self-aware artist. Yes. That's yes. one of the things that, this play is not a history lecture. It is a play no. about the relationship between Armstrong and Joe Glazer, his white Jewish manager. But in the course of describing this relationship and portraying it, you find out a lot about what Armstrong was really like, what his career was like, how he really felt about things. Uh, and that's important too. The play contains the context, but it's not a lecture. It's a real play. Right. No, and the other thing that you, that you make in his relationship with Joe Glazer, who he allowed to control his money for better or for worse, and people looked at him and said, how can you let this white man control your destiny? But as you make so clear, in the context of this time, 
Louis Armstrong was traveling around. They wouldn't let him stay in hotels. They wouldn't let yeah. him eat in the restaurant. They, he was he was completely beholden. You just got to remember who he was and where he came from. Born yeah. in 1901 in Storyville, New Orleans, in the gutter, a black man, and nothing was open to him. He opened the world for himself, but and he for yeah, but he needed and knew that he needed the help of a strong well-connected and as we discover in the play a mob connected white yeah. manager to get him through those doors what mobs and mob involved in mobs clubs and jazz music, yeah. <laughs> i never knew, Who knew? I never right? knew. <laughs> Tell, give us a sense you mentioned um that he recorded a lot of his conversations mm. what did he talk about what what, what was he what was oh, he like he in those talked about everything Tell him about the one with lucio <laughs> my this is my favorite tape um armstrong he was one of the very first civilian, so to speak, to own a tape recorder. He bought his first one in 1947. He bought it to tape his shows so that he could listen to them and perfect them. <laughs> I mean, he's, again, a serious artist. But it was a wonderful toy. And also, remember that this is a man who knew what he was. He knew how important he was. So he started taping conversations just randomly. And eventually, you know, he would turn the tape recorder on at a dinner party or in his dressing room. There's a tape of him. Uh, getting high backstage at a club with Stephen Fetched, but the John, the tape John is talking about, yeah. he was somewhere. The Richard Nixon of the jazz clubs. <laughs> yes. Well, he didn't make any secret of it. Everybody knew yeah. it. But this well, tape, knew they were being. Yeah, they knew what yeah, was going yeah, on. Yeah. But sometime in the fifties, he's somewhere on the road in a hotel room with his wife Lucille, and he's turned on the tape recorder, and she doesn't realize it, and he is attempting to get her into the sack. It's about two or three in the morning. <laughs> And she's really not interested. She she doesn't she she she's not up for that at this time of night. Mm -hmm. And you know he says, well, you know, you've got to do it because you, you know it's your duty to keep that horn percolating. <laughs> <laughs> Lucille's not going to have any of that. <laughs> and then she looks around and she sees that the tape, tape recorder is, is on. Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> and she says, you turn that off, Lewis. In fact, you erase that. And he says. I can't do that. It's for posterity. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll never forget. When this, these tapes are all on deposit at the Armstrong Archives at Queens College. I was working on the book. I was listening to this tape, you know, in the very formal setting of a library and archive. And I've got my headphones on. And he says this. And mm. suddenly it hits me. Oh. That's me. I'm posterity. Here I am yeah. listening to this listening. tape. And he was also a writer himself and, a good yeah. and wrote the first yeah. autobiography. He two, he yeah, he wrote the first autobiography by a jazz musician. His second one was written without any assistance, right. no ghostwriter. Right. Uh, he wrote these thousands of letters. He is just, he honest in the autobiography? I mean, you've, yes. you've looked at his life. Is he in candid time. or is he... I mean, there are things that he leaves out, but right. he never distorts. He understands, I believe, that he is a major figure in history. And he feels that he does have a debt to posterity. Yeah. You know, there's obviously some 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 curse words on the tapes, and, and, and as there are in the play, as there are in the play, <laughs> and you just get a different perspective of Armstrong, a much more human perspective. And which you give us, but also the thing is that, that Louis Armstrong make a, made a big point of always presenting this positive yeah. front, even when he was singing "Black and Blue." What did I do? Be so black and blue. He said, I don't want to to make it so that people are depressed by it. Right. You, and he you, would, uh, they would sing and perform in a way that would still, still make be upbeat feel about yeah. happy yeah. about even a song that they're hearing. Even a right? song like that downer. of a racial, yeah. a racial showbiz. oppression. Show, yeah. He was fundamentally an optimist. Now he wasn't naive right. in any way. He knew the score about the world. Right. But he he looked on the bright side. Yeah. And his music contains, contains. And also, he got yeah. stoned every night of his every life. Every day of his life. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> Do you play? Good I mean, man. That was, Good man. Did you bring that little bit of a stone? <laughs> uh, like, no, your I'm a method actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to ask you guys. We we know what uh, Coltrane and, and Davis thought about him and the the condescending Certainly, primarily, yeah, attitude primarily they had. Davis, what did yeah. he think about them? What did he think about their music and what they were doing? Certainly from the play, the perspective of the play, he felt, you know, that, that bop, Terry can speak more to the specifics, but that bop music was a little bit too fast, moving in a direction that wasn't quite uh, listener friendly. Right, got out too far in front of the yeah. audience, I think I'm And I even make that play, I yeah. even make that mention in the play that the beboppers got too far out in front of the people, and his idea was to please the audience, to give them what they wanted. 
right. and figuring that bebop was not what certainly his audience wanted. At the same time, though, he listened to this music. He really admired Gillespie as a trumpet player, said so many yeah. times. His record collection survives, and we know what its contents were. He even listened to Thelonious Monk. Hmm. So he had a right to these opinions. They weren't just reflexes. And didn't he also feel, uh, now this is when he was an older artist, mm -hmm. some dismay that he was playing at the Waldorf, for instance, to a totally white audience, whereas these other younger men were playing to black audiences, and he just wasn't getting them because he wasn't being perceived in the same well, way. Yeah, he began to lose his black audience, what well, many yeah. jazz musicians yeah. did. Yeah. Well, you know, it was kind of more pointed with Armstrong because he was such a strong representation of black pride when he began to play and he had a huge black audience that followed him all over and then towards the end of his career certainly if not towards the end but even maybe even more towards the middle going to the end he started to lose that black audience and you get a lot of younger blacks who are into jazz following people like Miles Davis mm -hmm. and Coltrane and all these bombers. And he was the Hello Dolly man. Hello Dolly, this is Louis Dolly. This is the guy who did Hello, Hello Dolly started jazz music, uh, influenced pop music, but we give you a much more broader understanding. But we also give the devil his due, so to speak, mm -hmm. because the third character in the play is Miles Davis. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and which you also do, yes. I yeah. play, yeah. The setting of the play is Armstrong's dressing room at the Waldorf. It's his last gig a few months before his death. Uh, he's just come off stage after the last set. Uh, he's talking to you about what his life has been like, and then suddenly, Joe Glazer appears, and he is also talking about his relationship with Armstrong. Uh, the play appears at first to be a, a dialogue between, between the, two the two men, but then uh, Miles Davis shows up and expresses this point of view that, that is familiar to John's generation, that Armstrong was an Uncle Tom, that he was out of touch. So you really have this, I think, very complex dialogue of these three points of view on Armstrong. Right. And the, the thing that's really interesting with, with Glazer and Armstrong is they're both commenting on the same experience, but they have different perspectives right. of it, how it actually turned out. Right. And Armstrong, we, we, certainly with Miles Davis, and he was a character that we added later on mm -hmm. in the process of working perspective, on the play, yeah. to really be the strong detractor mm -hmm. and represent that voice that was really pointing at Armstrong and saying, no, this guy's a bad example. Don't follow him. I wanted to give them all their due, all the points of view their due. Mm -hmm. that the deck is not stacked. I mean, in my biography, obviously, I tell you what my point of view is. But in this play, the characters are speaking, in a sense, for themselves. And you must make up your own mind yeah. who you side with. Or maybe you decide that you side with all of them or none of them. Yeah. Each perspective, perhaps, may be valid at that particular time. Yeah, it's kind of... Because his choice of material, then, was, was interesting. Um, I think of that song, that James, James, the James Bond song from Honor Majesty's... We have all the time have, in the I world. Mean, I, 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 I have to say, one of his very last records. I, mean, I got to say, I, I, I love like that it. song. I, I, I like do. it. I but like I mean, it. if you're Miles Davis, you got to think, uh, why is the guy picking this goop? Why did he do that? You yeah, why, why is yeah. he doing yeah. this goop? And of because course, if you're he... Louis Armstrong, you know that you don't have all the time in the world. That's right. You're an old, sick man. And that adds and that's a what whole that different song. layer of meaning it's, to it. You have the incredible work he did in the 1920s, in the late 20s and 30s, these innovative, hot amazing fives and hot jazz sevens, records. Yeah. And the one thing that Glazer, the white manager who came and put him on the road and made him a superstar, he said, um, you have to enunciate better and clean up your tunes for the white man because you have early Louis Armstrong who was scat singing and you couldn't understand the words, but it's so dynamic. He's like a great rock singer, just with such energy and, and drive. And yet at the same time, as Armstrong says in the play, and this is what he felt in real life, he also loved singing ballads. Yeah. And he yeah. loved the idea of broadening his audience and singing quite sophisticated songs like Body and Soul. He was the first person to make a jazz recording of Body and Soul, for example, when these songs were new. So it, it's never as simple yeah. as it looks. So, yeah. John, you are so talented, but but you do not play the trumpet, am I correct? No, I do and not. He, but, but you managed, wouldn't I guess it to look it. at it. That's right. That was one of my, you know, when Terry brought the play to me, I said, listen, I can't sing. <laughs> And I can't play the trumpet. He says he can't. But you sing, do but sing. You're, you're, but I do. I he's do sing a little you. bit. You know, I do. He's going to learn fig figuring. Well, no, no. I, you know, I went to some people at Tanglewood because I was up at Shakespeare at the time, 
And I said, can you guys teach me just a little bit of, of Armstrong on the trumpet, you know, from what you can teach me? And they said, we can't. Nope. We can't play his notes. I mean, some of them haven't even been codified. Wow. We can't do anything with that for you. And I never wanted, I never wanted an actor to pretend to be playing the trumpet. Right. That never looks right. right. Yeah. But John, you know, he cleans the trumpet, he disassembles it, puts it back together right. again. He, he came holds up with it like ways to make player. it look like you know. Yeah, I think you might well come away from the show thinking that you'd heard John play the trumpet. Do we know what kind of trumpet he played? A Selmer. Selmer. A Selmer. And the trumpets are available. Like, can you see the trumpets at the at the Armstrong Archive? You can see lots of Armstrong trumpets, mouthpieces, uh, even one of the handkerchiefs that he used on yeah. stage. Yeah. We got Ed with Hello Dolly. He's oh just, well, his, <laughs> biggest him number, tell it. his number one record. John's a kid singing. What the heck is this guy doing <laughs> singing the song from, well, from this yeah. Broadway musical? It's so popular it knocks the Beatles off, off the, the top, top of the, the chart. chart. Off the top of Most the chart. Most people know Armstrong because of Hello. Dolly. Hello, Dolly. You were just talking about the hot fives and the hot sevens. Even Early people stuff. who know of Armstrong do not know that music. So he does Hello, Dolly's biggest hit of all time, but he hates the song, right? What is Didn't like the song. <laughs> Didn't like the song. He, Glazer, Glazer was approached. Armstrong was between recording contracts, and uh, the, the song plugger said, I've got a song from a show that's going to be opening in a few months, and it's Hello, Dolly. And Glazer said, you know, Lewis, record this. And Armstrong listened to it, and well, I, I can't say on this show what, what he says in play. About it? <laughs> but he, he, he didn't like the song. He didn't think it was very interesting. But he trusted Glazer. He trusted his commercial instinct. So he makes the record, and then he goes out on the road. Take it, John, because yeah, it's makes quite the record, a tale. He goes out on the road. He's playing in a concert, and all of a sudden, people in the concert are asking him to play "Hello, Dolly." And Armstrong, you know, I'm telling it as it is in the play. And it's minus, true. It's true. It's true. Minus the Armstrong, four Armstrong <laughs> looks over at the piano player and says, you know, what, are, what is the audience talking about? What the hell are they talking about? And the, the, uh, the piano player says, they want you to play that song that you cut in New York a couple of months ago. Armstrong didn't know what it was. Couldn't remember it. Couldn't remember <laughs> the words to it. Couldn't remember the title of it. So as it turns out, he calls Glazer. Glazer ships him out a record on the of next Hello Dolly plane. on the next plane, <laughs> the next day. They sit in the room and they kind of study the song, <laughs> remember it. And even though at that point, while he's listening to the song with the rest of the band, he says to the band, the song still sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to give the audience what they want. What they want. You know, yep. he was really into that. So then, and that's when I get up and I sing. Hello, Dolly. <laughs> That's our 11 o'clock number. That's right. <laughs> no galloping waiters, yeah, though, right? Yeah. No. Sounds just like pops. Yeah. But that, you know, Take the, it from me. He does. <laughs> the interesting thing I, I find, at least for me as an actor working on the play and doing the play, is going in and out of these characters, mm -hmm. right? To create this very complex story, given these three characters, the two main right. ones being obviously Armstrong and, and Glazer and their perspectives on the same event. Yeah. And that was important to me. I, you know, I have my day job, obviously, is I'm a drama critic. And I often have occasion to review one-person shows about famous mm. historical figures. Mm. And they tend to be, somebody comes out on stage, and in the, ca in the play, the yeah, they're old. Yeah. And they spend 90 minutes <laughs> yeah. telling you how great and wonderful they are. Right. Yeah. That I did this, that I did that. The day I was born. Yeah. Yeah. Plays yeah. like that. Gordon Edelstein, the director of Satchmo, he calls them taxidermy plays. <laughs> and I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to write that kind of play. Since I don't like it, what I, why would I want to write it? I wanted to write a play that is driven not by the desire to celebrate, but by dramatic conflict. Yeah. And that was where the idea came to have the actor yeah. play Armstrong and Glazer, which means he has to cross a racial line yeah. to do it, and to do it on a dime, just yeah. like that. And yeah. then Those John came switches. along, and he can do it. It's like magic. What he I does never is thought like I, you know, I never really thought looking at it. I said, and I remember sometimes in rehearsals because there's a lot of lines. It's a one-person play. It's you keeping the energy, keeping the pace. There's no second actor coming in. My second actor is the audience for all. You, you are he. Right? <laughs> but I remember just sometimes in rehearsals, like not knowing who, which character I was, when, yeah. and you know, a funny thing happened last night, which was really a conflict of like the perfect storm where I was trying to go through a section of the play to remember where I had injured myself the night before I had hurt myself. So I was like really keeping an eye open for this. And I get to a line and I'm like, that's the place where I hurt myself last night. 
don't do this again. And I say a line and there's a laugh that I'd never gotten before from a woman in the audience with a very particular laugh. And I lost track of the whole show. <laughs> I didn't know if I was Armstrong or Glazer or Davis. I had left the room as Armstrong, and Glazer, you Actually, and you started circling I the started stage. circling the stage, talking, and I just said, you know what? To the audience, looked them right in the face. I said, you know what? I, I'm going to have to start over again because I lost my place and I lost my line. So and please. they loved it. Oh, I bet. And but it was know, so it wonderful. In I totally thought that that would be but John, if the it, death of my if, career. John, if, no. it ever happen, if it ever happens again, when in doubt, yes. just take a pause and go breathe. Hello, no. <laughs> oh, Dolly. Dolly. Well, hello. And the audience will love and they that, will right? Love it. They'll love it. Eight bars of Hello, That's Dolly. It. Okay, the play is called uh, Satchmo at the Waldorf. Uh, terrific new play um, about Louis Armstrong, so, uh, starring the wonderful John Douglas Thompson, written by our friend Terry Teachout of the Wall Street Journal, and also Pops, which is uh, still you can still get, right? Uh, you sure can. Still available. Great. Thanks yeah, a lot for being our guest tonight. The John. West Side Theater upstairs. West Side Theater upstairs. Delicious. That's right. Come see us. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night.